Thank you, Jose. It's, it's my great pleasure to be to be here. I, I apologize for my French accent. I hope uh, you will be able to cope with this uh, for the time of my presentation. Yes, I didn't take exactly the, the title that was suggested, and I apologize for this. I, I tried to, to change things a little bit and give you something here which reflects maybe more the state of mind of the lab at the moment and this uh, sort of uh, attempt that I have made over the last few years uh, to, to sort of balance homeostasis and pathogenesis and, 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 and look again at the you know, pathogenesis of shigellosis which uh, has been uh, our bread and butter, I would say, for many, many years, but also now trying to figure out uh, how homeostasis uh, is established in the gut and what is the role of, this, uh, of these commands on microorganisms. In a way, sort of switching from uh, cellular microbiology, as it's called, of, of pathogens to cellular microbiology of, of symbiosis, there is a lot done with regard to the microbiota. Uh, in terms of metagenomics, this is very descriptive and correlative. It has to be done, of course. I don't think I could do that because the technologies are too complicated for me to understand. But uh, basically, uh, I think they will at some point need people like us who look at the interaction between microbes and cells and tissues. And so this is going to become a sort of integrated approach. So that is the sense of my title, Pathogens and Common Soil War and Peace at Mucosal Surface. Uh, I will tell you that I uh, will try to be not as long as the, 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 the Tolstoy novel because, uh, you know, everybody has you know, looked at the nine volumes. Actually, there is a funny story that's in one of uh, Woody Allen's movies. He says, I, I took this uh, uh, quick reading course uh, and I read War and Peace in 20, in, uh, in 20 minutes. Uh, it's about Russia. So <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to be about microbiology here. <laughs> The other important point and, uh, is that the more I get, you know, advanced, uh, let's say in age, uh, the more I think that all this, of course, and this is not necessarily a surprise in the country of Darwin, uh, everything has to do with evolution or coevolution. And I really look more and more into this, uh, especially as we get to, to the command source uh, under the angle of uh, of, um, of evolution or coevolution in this case, and, and, and really like this uh, citation of uh, Dobzhansky, uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I think it's not just a, a statement. I mean, it, it helps me a lot now to try to think about even designing experiments, because at the end of the day, these microbes have been, he has been here before us. Uh, and they know us a lot better than ourselves. So I think we, we should learn from them. We should learn from uh, their strategies. And, 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 and this might also have application with regard to therapeutics, for instance. So this is sort of a short introduction about uh, all this. So the first point I wanted to raise is about uh, the uh, fact that when you think about it, and again, this is an issue of, of coevolution, our immune system has not just evolved probably uh, to sort of try to eradicate pathogenic microbes whenever uh, they are aggressing us uh, on surfaces, especially on mucosal surfaces, which is our topic of research. It's also probably evolved uh, to, to maintain, to tolerate uh, the uh, commensal microorganisms, which, as we see now, turn out to have very important functions in uh, metabolism, nutrition, uh, development of the immune system itself, as well as a certain number of other options that I would mention very, very briefly. So in a way, uh, the, the, the balance is complicated because uh, you have on the one hand to be able to recognize tolerate uh, this mass of symbionts, especially uh, the microorganisms in the colon, for instance, 10 to the 11 microorganisms per milliliter of, of fecal uh, fluid or fecal matter, which is a huge number at the end. So this we have to recognize and, and, and tolerate. And on the other hand, within seconds or minutes, we have among this huge number of microorganisms to identify one that is a pathogenic microorganism and set up uh, the innate and following adaptive immune response. 
And at the end of the day, we don't have so many tools to recognize or to discriminate between these microorganisms. They all have LPS, at least the gram negative. They all have peptidoglycan. Many have flagellin. So basically, there is nothing that you can read uh, in the genome or on the surface of the microorganisms which would say, you know, this one is going to be better recognized by these toll like receptors and other sensors than others. So there must be something else. And uh, I will come back to this in my uh, Shigella part of the talk, which is uh, uh, it probably has to, to, a lot to do about recognizing the dangerous signals, these endogenous signals which are induced by the pathogens because they aggress the tissues and things appear which do not appear in the case of an interaction with, uh, with um, uh, 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 symbiotic microorganisms. So again, this is a very complex uh, process and coevolution certainly has helped to fine tune all these interactions. Uh, just a quick reminder, we are in the field of uh, bacterial recognition here, so we recognize the outside world or the outside microbial world through this uh, TOLAC -like, uh, receptor microorganism. When I say outside, it's in the extracellular milieu. And this is certainly a generic sort of system to be able to recognize microorganisms, and that again didn't help so much in spite of the fact that uh, the microbial factor of what are called PAMS, pathogen-associated molecular uh, motifs, uh, actually we are more and more talking about MEMS, microbial-associated uh, molecular patterns. So this didn't help so much until in the beginning of the 2000s, with Dana Philpot in the lab uh, at Institut Pasteur in my lab and uh, Gabriel Nunez in the United States, we, we realized that they were intracellular and more than intracellular, intracytosolic sensors for microbial patterns. And this was the beginning of the saga of the NOD molecules. NOD1, which recognizes, as we showed at the time, muamyl tripeptide. Uh, which is a byproduct of the synthesis and turnover of the peptidoglycan in gram-negative, mostly in gram-negative microorganisms, and muramyl dipeptide, uh, which is a sort of simpler and shorter molecule, uh, which is recognized by uh, the NOD2 uh, version of these NOD molecules. And this was, even though it doesn't explain all this issue of discrimination of pathogen, it was the, the beginning of realizing that maybe there was something there, because having a lot of microbial products inside a cell is not a good thing. I mean, it proves that the cell has been aggressed or engaged very severely by a pathogen. Therefore, uh, we started to think that there might be different functions of these uh, sensing molecules, some of them scanning, uh, again, the outside environment and, and, and others being there to detect uh, more serious uh, aggression, even though, again, now we know that there are transporters that brings these uh, muramyl dipeptide and other molecules inside the cells, but probably in a much more controlled way than when a bacterium, for instance, invades a cell since these NOD molecules, we recognize them thanks to Shigella, uh, which uh, invade, uh, invade epithelial cells. So, sort of in closing my, my introduction, uh, if you put yourself in, in the position of a microorganism, so start thinking uh, after 30 years working on, 35 years working on, think, I, I start thinking like a, a microbe, and it's not necessarily a bad thing if you wish to understand what's going on. We, we are here on the surface of the intestinal epithelium, uh, and, and so this is the mucus layer, and the brownish staining here corresponds to an antimicrobial peptide. It's a beta defensin, HBD3, this cathogenic peptide. Uh, we've heard already uh, that you know, punch holes in the bacterial membranes and, 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 and kill the bacteria. So this is here stained just to, to give you a sort of, uh, or to materialize the situation at the surface of the epithelium. Uh, in this very dense lattice of mucus, which is close to the epithelium, are entrapped lots of toxic molecules for microorganisms, not just antimicrobial peptides, but also oxygen radicals, uh, enzymes like lysozymes, proteases, phospholipases, uh, secretory IgAs, other transmigrating phagocytes make their way in between the cells. So, uh, in a way, if by nature, you are a pathogen, therefore you need to 
engage the surface of the epithelium, you have to be ready to face this very dangerous area. Uh, and this is why I say that uh, you know, getting to this place is, is like sitting on, on, a, on a volcano. So there are two ways to cope with this. Uh, one is to be resistant to these factors. Uh, this is almost impossible. The other one, and this will be illustrated hopefully in my talk on Shigella, uh, is to subvert these mechanisms, to start playing with the cells, with the transcription, uh, with some of the uh, byproducts, and, 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 and basically uh, be able to make or disconnect the, the mechanisms that uh, induce the production of these antimicrobial molecules. And, and, and it's clearly, again, in terms of coevolution, uh, there hasn't been a possibility for bacteria following acquisition of genes that push them in this environment to survive without having, on the top of that, acquired other genes. And you can start reading in the genomes uh, this complementarity of aggressive uh, molecules encoded by these genes, and, and now uh, genes encoding uh, molecules that uh, subvert uh, the uh, innate uh, immune response, and, and I will come back to this. So this is, again, another uh, element which I wanted to bring in the discussion, and having this in mind, you can start the segregatory process. Uh, the uh, Commensals, for instance, uh, they, they have evolved a way which is to stay away from the epithelial surface. So they sit as complex colonies, uh, you would say biofilms, even though we can discuss the, 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 the real nature of, of, of biofilms here. So they remain at distance. There is a sort of no man's land or no bacterial land, which is uh, uh, you know, achieved here, which is the substrate is the mucus. And, and this puts these microbes at distance of the gradient of antimicrobial molecules, which I just mentioned. It doesn't mean that they are ignored, of course, because the tolerogenic process of these microbes needs recognition. So they are permanent exchanges. Uh, the, the host has actually harnessed the capacity, of course, as we say, to recognize fragments, PAMs, but also they recognize uh, molecules like autoinducers that regulate the inflammatory responses. So basically, this kind of permanent sampling and recognition process will lead to this tolerogenic signal, which tend to keep uh, the uh, mucosal immune response, especially uh, the dendritic cells and, and, and the T lymphocytes in a situation of uh, low inflammatory response. So the dendritic cells remain rather immature, and, and we are here uh, in a situation with a ratio of, of, of T regulatory lymphocytes, which is superior to the so-called pro-inflammatory lymphocytes like Th1 and Th17, and all the details, all the mechanisms of this uh, still need uh, to be uh, completely elucidated. The, the, the big challenge at the moment is, is to find out molecules from these commensal microorganisms which actually directly participate in this status of, of tolerance or tolerogenesis, and one of the best examples is probably this uh, acidic polysaccharide, which was discovered many years ago now, to 2005, by the group of Denis Kasper, Sarkis Masmanian was the first author. These uh, so-called zviterianic polysaccharide, uh, which have the capacity to have this anti-inflammatory uh, effect, both at the uh, mucosal but also at the systemic level. And uh, I would say that the microbiota is probably a gold mine of such bioreagents, and, and we should really start looking into it carefully because this could have interesting uh, medical applications in the, in the future. So that is so much for the, the true symbionts. Some microorganisms are a little more adventurous in their behavior, and I'm talking here about one that is very characteristic, which is uh, called SFB. Uh, it's the Segmentus filamentus bacterium. It's, uh, this microbiological name is uh, Artromitus candidatus. It's a, it's a clostridium which has a very weird way of dividing. It starts by binary fission, and then uh, after a certain number of division, it ends up in, in kind of 
correlation process. So there are underspores that are made, some are real spores, others are uh, actually uh, what's called IOS, which will recede after the lysis of uh, these uh, cells, uh, the, the, the system, and so they, they end up with this uh, sort of filaments that are actually embedded uh, in the tip uh, of, in the apical side of uh, intestinal uh, epithelial cells. And as has been shown by uh, the group of Ivo, uh, the group of Dan Littman in the, in the United States and the group of Nadine um, Serf Ben Susang in Paris, these, ma these microorganisms appear very early in life at the stage of colonization that is at least clear in mice. And they induce this sort of uh, what's now called physiological inflammatory state. Uh, the cells are a little more differentiated. We start seeing Th17 cells, for instance, which are induced by these SFB uh, interactions. Uh, so we, 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 th this has been called pathobionts, and probably we need them in a, in a limited manner. They shouldn't be overwhelming. They should be controlled, but they, they play a role. And there is more and more of this idea that it's not the whole microbiota that does all these things. It's, it's the role of some specific microorganisms. And, and we need to identify them and, of course, to identify the effectors. And actually, Pamela Schnupf, a postdoc from Germany uh, in, in my lab, has recently been able to cultivate um, this uh, SFB molecule uh, in vitro, and, and, and this is going to help us ask questions about this cellular microbiology of pathobionts, which I think is a very important uh, area once again. So that's what I wanted to tell you about sort of uh, introduction. The other element is why all this Probably, again, because by coevolution we need these microorganisms, so we had to learn to cope with them, and the system has been tuned in such a way that uh, we uh, have established these mechanisms of tolerance, which can be broken for some reasons, uh, either by your genetic defect of the host or by this uh, so-called dysbiosis, which disrupts the equilibrium between these pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, or whatever microorganisms. So all this is very fragile. But, in a way, also robust, and again, robustness is, is certainly the fruit of, of coevolution. So, I used to show this slide, which is a bit naive, and I apologize by saying that, you know, the microbiota uh, is pushing, putting pressure on the intestinal epithelium, and, and, and it's, it's a bit like an endocrine gland. So, this epithelium is going to produce uh, mediators, which are eukaryotic mediators, but also some microbial products like endotoxin or peptidoglycan fragments are passing the epithelial barrier. We do have endotoxin in the blood. We do have peptidoglycan in the blood. And, and these molecules that circulate, uh, they probably act like hormones, and, and they, they serve to sort of tune the system to a certain level. This is, again, the issue of uh, uh, physiological inflammation, not just at the mucosal level, maybe also at the periphery, so that when any accidental event like an infection occurs, we don't have to recapitulate the whole thing from the beginning. We, we can respond in a quick uh, and, and educated way. So all this has to do, of course, with the immune response, but there are more and more evidence that this interaction has an impact on adip adipogenesis, for instance, uh, in the physiological status, but also uh, there are uh, pathologies and uh, it's more and more clear that uh, the microbiota plays a role uh, in insulin resistance, obesity, and, and diabetes. There are evidence that the microbiota is necessary for bone metabolism to increase the activity of osteoclast and, and favor the turnover of uh, uh, bone trabeculation. Uh, the um, uh, microbiota is essential for the maturation of vessels in the, in the small in, in the intestine in general, in the mucosal tissues, but there is recent evidence by Sven Peterson, for instance, uh, at the Karolinska, that uh, the microbiota is also essential for the maturation of the blood-brain barrier, and this opens the way to some interpretation with regard to some neurological diseases, and so on and so forth. And what I would like to show you is a new example of the role of the microbiota, which is uh, epithelial regeneration, and I will start with uh, this after these uh, introductions. So 
This is a first story which I, I would have hoped that uh, I would have presented some unpublished uh, data to you, but unfortunately the paper has been accepted a couple of weeks ago, so this is going to appear very soon. So the work is from Julia Nigro. She's a postdoc in, in, in the lab, very, very bright fellow. And uh, what we started to do was to, to work on the intestinal crypt. Why the intestinal crypt? Because the intestinal crypt, as you know, is the uh, area of epithelial regeneration. Uh, we have these uh, stem cells, uh, which are called LGR5 positive. They express this R-spondin receptor, which is LGR5. Uh, they were before uh, called, as you see here, uh, you know, crypt-based columnar cells because they are sort of squeezed uh, in between these panet cells, uh, which are uh, cells that, first of all, produce uh, mediators, growth factors like airspondin, wing ligands that uh, nurture, foster the stem cells. But also in the small intestine, they, they, they have another function, which is to produce alpha defensins, which are very potent antimicrobial molecules. So this is a very important area uh, to be studied. And the idea at the end of the day was, is there a role of this microbiota uh, epithelium interaction uh, in terms of controlling uh, epithelial regeneration. So then we go to this uh, proliferative compartment, then the cells stop cycling, and they finalize the differentiation and, and they die. So that is the sort of uh, process. And in the large intestine, in the colon, we have similar process, except that we don't have villi here. We just have this very long crypt, uh, and uh, basically the, the, the same process applies. Uh, the only difference is that the panet cells are kind of weird cells here. They don't seem to produce uh, any kind of uh, antimicrobial molecules, and they, they, they are not so well uh, characterized. But still, we have the same presence of, of this LGR5 positive uh, cells. I'm not going to talk about some work that we've done, and part of it is already published about uh, whether there is a, a specific microbiota in this script. There is known in the small intestine, at least in healthy conditions in the mouse. On the other hand, in the cecum and in the, in the proximal colon, we've been able to define what we've called a, a crypt-specific core microbiota, which is interestingly constituted essentially of uh, aerobic, strictly aerobic, non-fermentative microorganisms like Acinetobacter, Delftia, Stenotrophomonas, which was very unexpected. They are there all the time, and uh, we are now, of course, trying to figure out why they are there, are they protecting the crypt, are they producing these homeostatic signals if they are displaced by more aggressive microorganisms, are we going to see some chronic inflammation established, and, and, and this, of course, opened the way to colonic cancer, for instance. So we are more and more uh, into this area, but we started on a more sort of simple way uh, by uh, doing the, the following experiments. So we decided to study the crypts, uh, thanks to the very nice model that Hans Clevers uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, has developed over the last um, six or seven years now, uh, which is the model of organoids or miniguts. So what you basically do is that you, you take a mouse, you, you take the, the intestine, you detach the epithelium, you purify the crypt, and then you transfer the crypt in matrigel with uh, growth factors, especially with uh, r And uh, over the time, Within four days, you start to see these mini guts that are formed, which are called organoids. And they are actually extremely interesting because they have the stem cells. You can see them here, they fluoresce because uh, this is a, 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 a transgenic mouse that has a GFP under the control of the LGR5 promoter. And then they give the lineages, uh, the mucus producing cells, the regular intestinal epithelial cells, enterochromaffin cells, and so on and so forth. So this is really a, a mini gut, and you can start forgetting the immunological environment, which is, uh, you know, part of the exercise. Uh, at least at this stage, you can start uh, studying interaction of these uh, organoids. Uh, with, uh, um, with microbial products, for instance, or microbes that we started with microbial products. So <clears throat> this is the kind of experiments that uh, Julia did. Uh, she added 
PAMPs, highly purified or even synthetic PAMPs, to these organoids. Uh, and what you see here is the number of organoids which are formed, or oh, here is the ratio uh, of organoids compared to, to the control experiments, uh, which are formed from a given number of grapes transplanted uh, into this uh, matri gel with the growth factors. So this is uh, the number uh, of, the, the, the one is for, for the number of organoids we get with controls. And what you see is that you have a much higher number of organoids obtained five times, six times, sometimes more than that uh, when you add peptidoglycan or muramyl dipeptide at the time of extraction of the crypt before they are transferred into the matri gel. On the other hand, the ligands for node one, like uh, Tetradap, which is the sensor uh, in the mice, uh, are not providing any change in number of, of, of organoids. Uh, lipopolysaccharide doesn't change. It is even toxic for some of them. Flagellin doesn't do anything. PAN3, which is a TOL2 uh, agonist, doesn't do anything. So basically the story here, and this has nothing to do with the increased growth, for instance, or proliferation, it's, it's really the survival of the stem cells, directly or indirectly, uh, that is uh, linked to the effect of this uh, peptidoglycan here. So the more uh, MDP, the more of these organoids. This is actually uh, an organoid which has been loaded by uh, fluorescent peptidoglycan before the reseal uh, we add, uh, of course, the, the fluorescence peptidoglycan and then the seal. So basically the signal is from uh, the inside, from the apical side of the cells, which is what it is uh, in normal conditions. So I'm just saying a word about NOT2 because, of course, the uh, sensor of, of muramyl dipeptide, which is the molecule that does all this, is, is NOT2. So NOT2 is known so far as a pro-inflammatory molecule. So of course, that's how we showed it at the beginning. It's uh, activating RIC and, and goes to the NF-kappa-B pathway. More recently, it's been shown by groups from Dana Philpot, for instance, in Toronto and others, to be an activator of uh, the uh, autophagy pathway and to increase uh, the antigen presentation by class two molecules. So this is sort of linking possibly innate and adaptive immunity. But nothing was known about such function like survival of, uh, you know, crypt or intestinal crypt. So what Julia did was to establish tools and especially to purify cells and start combining cells and, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, showing, for instance, these uh, LGR5 positive stem cells in the crypt. Red is for the panet cell, so you see as defined before, they are squeezed in between these cells. Uh, and using this and other markers like CD24, for instance, you can sort of separate and, 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 and sort these, uh, the, these uh, stem cells. Uh, she also was able, and we were very lucky in this case, uh, since we are dealing with uh, MDP and NOT2, we wanted, of course, to work with NOT2 knockout mice. And fortunately, our NOT2 knockout mice had been engineered in such a way that uh, there is GFP, which has been inserted in the first exon of NOT2, which means that uh, the cells that express NOT2 at high level, uh, or in this case, there is a knockout, and the knock-in is, is with GFP, so the, these mice are, are not, not to uh, knock out, but they, 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 they show uh, where not to should have been expressed. And what you see is that not to is basically, uh, at least the GFP under the control of the not to promoter is essentially expressed again in, in the stem cells. So that is sort of how things have proceeded. And, and basically what you see here is the, if, you know, the, number of, or at least the ratio of organoids which is formed depending upon using a node one knockout mice or node two knockout mice. Uh, you see here that if you add polypeptidoglycan or MDP to a node one knockout mice, you, you, you see a lot of uh, increase of these uh, organoids as we've shown before. On the other hand, if you use a node two background, you see no uh, increase uh, in number of organoids. And the big surprise was to see that actually the stem cells express a very high level of transcripts for NOT2 compared to PANET cells. There was literature papers in the early 2000s showing that 
uh, not to was expressed in a constitutive manner into panet cells, uh, we really show the opposite here. We completely disagree with this. There is some uh, not too expressed in panet cells, but not at all at the level of the stem cells. So this put the stem cell uh, really in target to being the one that responds to uh, this uh, muramil dipeptide. So we went one step further with uh, um, Julia. I'm not going to get into the details of the experiments. Simply say that we purified stem cells from wild type mice, uh, panet cells from white type mice, stem cells from not two mice, knockout, stem, uh, panet cells from, uh, from, from uh, not two. We combined them, and, and at the end of the day, what we showed is that yes, panet cells have a nurturing function and a protective function to the stem cells. We see an increase in the number of organoids when we add them to the system, but the difference remains. Therefore, there is still a very strong effect uh, by the presence of uh, muramil dipeptide, which is independent of the presence of these, uh, of these uh, panet cells. So it's not an indirect effect on the panet cell. It's really a direct effect on the, on the stem cells. So basically, the message at this stage is that this is, for the first time, the evidence that the microbiota through muramil dipeptide, peptidoglycan in general, is able to cross talk with stem cells in the intestinal crypt and provide something which we call cytoprotection. So what we thought actually is that, you know, reviewers, they four times, five times, they, they think that this is not so striking. Uh, so you have to, to deal with this, and I, I tend to, to agree a little bit because you know, the, the not two knockout mice, they, they don't have a phenotype spontaneously. So we, we, we were hoping to see something uh, more striking with regard to epithelial repair. So we started to think that maybe this uh, pathway of cytoprotection is more sort of an emergency pathway in the case where stem cells are submitted to a, a strong stress. So what we did was to treat our mice three days before doing all these experiments, which I have described so far, with doxorubicin, which is a DNA intercalating agent, uh, which uh, actually um, not only causes a lot of uh, production of, uh, of oxidative stress, but also, as you can see here, because it fluoresces in red, is able to uh, basically be essentially captured by the stem cells. And we, we really need to start working on, on transporters in stem cells because there are very important things that have to be understand, understood sorry, with, with regard to, to their fragility to, to some toxic agents. So basically uh, what uh, doxorubicin is doing is to kill stem cells and, as we say, to, to kill the crypts because as the stem cells are dead, at least within a short period of time, uh, the epithelium cannot uh, regenerate before some other stem cells may come around and, 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 and take over, but this takes more time than the limits of our experiments. So what we showed here, uh, we looked at CASP-3 CASP activation in, in the crypt as a marker of crypt death, and what you can see here is that in a sort of wild-type background of mice, uh, when you uh, take the, 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 the mice without doxorubicin treatment, you have uh, this level of caspase positive cells, whereas if you treat with doxorubicin after 72 hours, you have a lot more uh, caspase 3 positive cells uh, at the level of the crypts. But now if you work in a NOD2 background, you see that the difference is a lot higher and you see uh, almost 60% crypts that are basically filled with, uh, with dead uh, or caspase 3 uh, positive uh, apoptotic cells. So this shows that there is an issue here which is interesting to consider, which had never been looked at with regard to uh, the function of NOD, which has to do with uh, toxicity to the gut. So if crypts are dead or in a very bad uh, you know, situation, they shouldn't uh, regenerate properly uh, the intestinal uh, epithelium. And this is what is shown here on these experiments. We established this is a lot of countings uh, following EDU staining for the cells that are cycling. Uh, we, we basically looked at uh, the ratio between EDU positive cells and the number of cells that constitute the crypt. All this is, is standardized. And what these experiments show basically is that uh, there is a lot less regeneration 
after doxorubicin uh, treatment uh, compared to uh, the system uh, in um, the case of uh, uh, no, no doxorubicin. And, 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 and again, the white type mice regenerate better uh, than the not two mice, as you can see here, for instance, at 72 hours. So we did a lot of other experiments, like killing the microbiota, just to be sure that uh, we could show MDP. So we killed the microbiota, we, we gavaged the, the mice with MDP, and, and, and we, we got the same, the same thing. So that's it. So what I would like to finish uh, with this, this part uh, with is, is to show you that I really think that we've shown something uh, important with regard to the function of NOD2, which was totally uh, unnoticed so far. Uh, and, and if we come back to, to the organoid model, uh, this is a mouse which has been treated for three days by doxorubicin, and then you take the crypt and transplant them uh, into uh, the uh, uh, matrigel without, that's the blue, or with MDP. And you see now that the number of organoids in terms of ratio compared to the control uh, is a lot higher, uh, like 16 times here, 15, 16 times, and sometimes we've had, for some reasons, uh, you know, 50 more uh, creeps in this case. So it's a very, very potent uh, cytoprotective system, which of course disappears uh, when you do the experiments with a not two knockout mass. So I think this is an Important in a way because maybe it, it illuminates the, the pathogenesis of Crohn's disease uh, a, a bit differently. It's a bit different angle. So far, you know, you, a lot of the severe forms of, of Crohn's disease, uh, especially those that start early in life, that cause massive destruction and fistula that need surgery, uh, they are linked to mutations in not two molecules. This was published uh, uh, by a group in France in 2001, Jean-Pierre Hugo, and a group in, in the United States, Agoura. And, and, and basically the idea is that not two mutations, because these mutations, which are essentially in the leucine-rich repeats area of the molecules, they, they kill uh, the function of not two, and this leads to deregulation of the inflammatory response. What these experiments, I think, propose is a bit of a new angle. Maybe what's going on here is that the, the, the stem cells need not to, to feed on the MDP from the microbiota to protect themselves against an aggression. So it's not impossible that in the pathogenesis of Crohn's disease now, you, you may have a, a sort of priming event, like an infection, maybe a viral infection in these young children who start um, uh, Crohn's disease at the age of five, six, or seven years. And, 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 uh, and following this aggression, they, they cannot repair uh, the uh, epithelium at the proper pace, and, and this fragilizes the epithelial barrier and facilitates uh, the uh, translocation of, of the microbiota and, and cause inflammation. So we are working on all these lines at the moment, but I was you know, I would like to, to share with you my, my excitement that this is really a, 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 the first time that, uh, you know, the, the microbiota is shown to, to have a, a true impact on, 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 on at the heart of the regenerative process, which is the, the adult stem cells. So the last part of my talk will be about Shigella because that was in the title, so I couldn't completely skip this. Uh, we are now in a different... Uh, Atmosphere, of course, I mean, the, the pathogen, they engage the cells compared to my naive slides of the beginning, and uh, they, they adhere, they, 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 they alter the membranes. There is more and more of a topic of, you know, the alteration of membranes as signaling of danger, and, and, and I will come back to this quickly. And this, of course, causes inflammation, and this is what makes all the difference. So basically, we, we have this first wave of sensing through the classical sensors, and then we have this second wave of signaling, which is essentially the danger signal, which is going to be integrated and perceived by the host as uh, this is a pathogen, and I should start the, the process of, uh, of response and, and, and uh, eradication. So Shigella is, is a good model, or turns out to be a good model to study this. This is Shigellosis, so it's massive uh, invasion of the colonic epithelium by the bacteria that causes inflammation, and uh, basically the symptoms are linked to this 
you know, efflux of polymorphonucleus, which on their way destroy the mucosa, the epithelium, and causes these uh, ulcerations in the gut. So that's the reason for the bloody diarrhea. So it's a disease that is largely restricted to the most impoverished areas of, of the planet. I'm not talking about this, but about the pathogenesis. But, you know, the crypt, it seems that we cannot escape the crypt. We, we all end up in a crypt anyway, but the, 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 the story is the following. We, we've been doing a lot of uh, human tissue, colonic tissue explants, because, again, the target of Shigella is, is, the, is the colon. Uh, we've also established now a guinea pig model, which is susceptible to, to Shigellosis, but this is a human uh, piece of, of, of colon. And what you see here, the, the dark holes are the crypts. So we see the, the crypts from, from, from the top. Uh, the blue will be the DAPI, the green will be uh, fluorescent Shigele, so, uh, and, uh, and then it's been looked, you know, analyzed by, by two photon microscopy. Uh, the red will be uh, for O'Neill the, the little aggregates of, of, of B cells, but this is uh, outside the, 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 the topic here, for, at least for the moment. So you see the, 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 the crypt, and, and these are the Shigella. So we, we've been very careful at not removing uh, the mucus on, on the epithelial surface. And it, it really turns out that the, the Shigella goes essentially, uh, as you will see here, for instance, uh, into the crypt. It doesn't go all the way down. So <laughs> we thought that the crypt was a sort of simple uh, organ. Uh, there, there are probably you know, substructures, or, or we, we have no idea what it is. Maybe it has to do with the mucus, with particularity of the mucus. Some of these crypts are empty for some reasons. Others were infected, as you've seen. So this is, to me, a, a sort of new, new frontier. <laughs> Not necessarily a very exciting frontier, because the visibility is very, very, very poor there. But uh, we, 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 we really like it, because it's, to me, it's an, a, a new world, and it's, it's really looked like organized uh, organs. There is something very, very essential here. So to come back to the classical physiopathology of Shigella, they enter through M cells. And there are M cells, actually, at the periphery of the, what we call the mouth of the crypt. Uh, they, they killed macrophages by pyroptosis. I won't get into the details of this, but this is probably the event that triggers inflammation. And then they penetrate into epithelial cells. They cause this actin rearrangement. They lyse the vagocytic vacuole. They have this protein that induces actin polymerization. They ex uh, allow them to, to escape autophagy and, and also allow them to, to move from one cell to another. So that's the sort of uh, uh, cellular biology tricks that Sheila uh, likes to do in the intestinal epithelium, all these being linked at all stages by the expression, to the expression of this type 3 secretion system. Uh, without this type 3 secretion system, Shigella is just another Escherichia coli. But what we had not so much looked at uh, before, and this really started about 10 or 12 years ago, was the, the inflammatory consequence of this. Uh, as the bacteria invade the cells, they, they cause a very strong pro-inflammatory reaction at the level of epithelial cells. They start producing antimicrobial peptides, or at least they, they induce the inducible ones. They start producing pro-inflammatory cytokines that recruit polymorphs, and that is necessary at the early stage because this disrupts the epithelial barrier and facilitates the bacterial invasion. Uh, the, 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 the passage uh, to the basolateral compartment. Uh, but at some stage, this is going to be, as we said at the beginning, deleterious to the microbe because the intensity of uh, the innate immune response is going to eradicate this microbe. So at some stage, the bacterium will have to do something to, again, as we said, subvert uh, this uh, local response, and, and, and uh, we will get into this uh, very quickly. So this is just the type 3 secretion system, but I don't think I need to get into this because it's uh, fairly well known now after so many years of description in many gram-negative pathogens. Uh, the essential element is this uh, sort of needle-like structure and, and tip structure, which allows to sort of engage uh, the plasmic membrane of the eukaryotic cell 
to make a sort of translocator uh, in it, and, and then uh, the process goes. The bacterium can inject some uh, effector molecules that do the changes in cytoskeleton and do also, as I just mentioned, the regulation of uh, the uh, immune response. All this is, is very um, uh, controlled in, in collaboration with my very good friend, uh, Chris Tang. Uh, when he was uh, still at Imperial, now he's at Oxford, we've generated it. Signature tag mutagenesis uh, library of mutants in Shigella. We've been uh, identifying a lot of interesting mutations, including this FNR mutation, for instance, fumarate nitrate reductase, which basically uh, is the, the switch um, of metabolism in the bacterium when it passes from aerobiosis to anaerobiosis. And the interesting thing, to make a long story short, is that uh, as they are in the anaerobic compartment, uh, this FNR reduces the expression of two major proteins which are important for the type 3 secretion system to establish this tip structure and be functional. So when they are floating uh, in the lumen of the intestine, they are not functional, but they keep their uh, effector molecules for better days. But at some point, they reach the epithelial surface. And uh, what we could show is that this competence of the type 3 secretion system is actually dependent upon uh, the concentration of oxygen. And at the time, it was very surprising for us that uh, the bacterium could find oxygen somewhere in the uh, intestinal lumen. And actually, this was confirmed by these uh, simple experiments. Now we've made more sophisticated me measurement, but this one is, is a lot more striking. This is a rabbit ligated in a loop model in which we've infected or simply inoculated with E. coli. It's a non-invasive microorganism which express GFP. So GFP needs oxygen to fluoresce. And what you see here is the surface of the epithelium. And, and here you see that the, the, the bacteria fluoresce only in the vicinity of, there are plenty of uh, red uh, microorganisms here, but the only that fluoresces are the ones that are within this 100 micron distance from the epithelial surface. And this is oxygen which actually trans sort of moves or, 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 or from, from the, the, the oxygenated tissue here uh, to the lumen and, and creates this sort of uh, interesting uh, uh, aerobic uh, area. And, and this probably explains what I said about the, 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 the oxygen, uh, the, the purely aerobic microorganisms in the, in the crypt at the beginning. I think there is a, a very interesting uh, area here at the surface that discriminates uh, the, uh, the, 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 the strictly anaerobic microbes uh, against the, the aerobic microbes, and, and we are working on this at, at the moment. So all this, again, coevolution, very sophisticated uh, process. Then Shigella enters uh, into the cell, and again, as I said, uh, there is a real scaffolding process with the node molecule for sensing of uh, the peptidoglycan fragment, which are going to turn on uh, the pro-inflammatory response, the nf kappa B, the MEP kinase uh, pathway. I, this is all known and, and, and published. What I would just like to, to finish my, my talk on is, is about the regulatory process. So again, Shigella has to cope with this massive inflammation, and the choice was to downregulate uh, this uh, innate response, and especially its major inflammatory component. So I would like to just show you one example which was uh, uh, recently published. Uh, it's a work by a, a postdoc in the lab, uh, Andrea, Andrea Puar. It's about IPGD. So IPGD is one of these molecules which are stored in the bacterial compartment. They don't have to be transcribed after activation of the type 3 secretion system, as it is the case for a certain number of others, including this OSP-G, OSP-F, and, and EPA-HS. This one is injected right away because it's already available. Therefore, its regulatory function is, is, is really sort of an immediate function. So this takes me to this notion of endogenous danger signaling, which I was talking about at the beginning. So it looks as if the sensing of danger is in part due to the fact that as a cell, 
especially an epithelial cell, which is really on the front line to cope with these uh, engaging microorganisms, uh, are sending signal very quickly. So we don't wait for transcription of uh, A genes, activation of NFKPB, transcription of all these pro-inflammatory genes. There are signals that come a lot earlier than that, probably within seconds after the cells have been engaged. And these molecules are small molecules like ATP, adenosine, uric acid, HMGB1. You could say IL-1 beta also because uh, in certain circumstances it is released very quickly because it's already stored. It's just the issue of uh, maturation and, 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 and secretion. So these small molecules are at high concentration in the intracellular compartment, very low concentration in the extracellular compartment because there are lots of sensors for these molecules. In the case of ATP, for instance, the purinergic receptors are present on all the cells of the immune system. So as soon as the ATP level increases, increases in the extracellular milieu, you get a very strong inflammation. So this is actually what we have shown to happen uh, in the case of Shigella. So what we had shown before with uh, Guy Tranvanu in the lab, we published that in 2003 in um, uh, Nature Cell Biology, was that uh, hemid channels, uh, which are excimer formed by these uh, molecules called connexins, they are, they are actually uh, involved in the formation of, of these uh, gap junctions uh, that form passage between uh, cells that are close to each other, but they are also as hemi channels open to the exterior and regulated in terms of their capacity to release some small molecules. And ATP has the proper molecular size to, to be released. So what we've been able to show in the case of uh, this work that I'm showing here is that as the epithelial cells are engaged by pathogens, whether it's Shigella or Salmonella or EPEC, they release, provided that they are connected, expressing, for instance, connexin 26 or 43, they release a high concentration of, of ATP. That is shown here. And this can be blocked by uh, carbenoxalon, for instance, or monoclonal antibodies that we have generated, uh, which uh, block the function of the connexins, or by lanthanide chloride, which is another uh, blocker. So this release of ATP is clearly due to uh, the opening of these uh, hemic channels, and we had shown before that this immediate presence of ATP is actually uh, activating the cytoskeleton and facilitating uh, the capture of the microorganism. So it, it has a positive effect for Shigella uh, at the beginning. That's point one. Point two is, then we, we had to, 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 to sort of put the two together. Uh, we were looking for some effectors of, of regulation of the system. And uh, we looked at uh, infection of the rabbit uh, intestinal in your loop by a wild type Shigella, M90T here. You see after eight hours, you have uh, this uh, shortened and then enlarged villi, rupture of the epithelium, but because uh, it's still there, it's altered, it's still there, very inflamed, but still around. Here is this IPGD mutant, which I just mentioned. Uh, there is no more intestine. The, 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 the inflammatory response is so drastic that it basically destroy all the mucosa uh, within uh, eight hours and, and even before, actually. The, 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 the very striking. And then when we looked at, uh, we, we, we've been able to generate on the basis of what's known of the rabbit genome sequence, a certain number of primers to do uh, RT-PCR. So uh, it's just a color code. It shows in the middle that the IPGD deficient uh, mutant causes a lot more inflammatory response than the wild type microorganisms. And if you express uh, the IPGD gene in trans, so there is a gene dose H effect here, you see that there is less inflammation than the wild type. So basically this <laughs> molecule has a very potent anti-inflammatory uh, function. So what is IPGD? IPGD is a phosphatidylinositol phosphatase. We had shown that with my, my friend um, Bernard Perast in, in CERN in Toulouse, who is an expert in phosphatidylinositol. What it does basically is to hydrolyze uh, the phosphate in position 4 from PI45 to lead to the production of, of PI5P. And here go the, the experiments. We've connected cells by expressing uh, connexin 26 or connexin 43, as I said. And what you can see here is that if they are exposed, 
either that's the control or to a non-invasive microorganisms to uh, the M90T strain, which is the invasive microorganisms, or to the IPGD mutant, you see that with time the cell produce or uh, secrete more and more ATP. And as I said at the beginning, this uh, release, massive release of ATP by the mutant, is actually down-regulated by these uh, molecules like uh, AGA or, or, or these, these antibodies um, that uh, block the, the function of, of the connexins. So a connexin-dependent uh, process, but basically the wild-type microorganisms has this capacity to reduce the release of ATP uh, from the cells. So the idea was that Basically, this IPGD molecule is likely to be the molecule that controls the uh, sort of release uh, of uh, ATP through this uh, hemichannel. And this was confirmed by several experiments, including by adding, for instance, in these cell assay systems, different phosphatidyl inositol, and showing that the only one that reduced efficiently uh, the ATP release was PI5P. So we are working now at trying to understand how PI5P, uh, there, there are at least one PI5P binding site on the C-terminal uh, domain of the connexin, which is known to, to get together in this uh, sort of barrel structure to make some sort of a cork in the middle, uh, which is blocking the, uh, uh, the passage of these small molecules. So it could be that PI5P by binding uh, to this uh, structure uh, is kind of regulating uh, the uh, possibility or not of ATP and other small molecules to be released. So we, we are working on this uh, at the moment. But just to say that you know, we wanted to show that in vivo, uh, and this is not a, a, a simple affair because ATP in the extracellular milieu in vivo is quickly degraded by, uh, by ATPases. There are all sorts of ATPases. So what we could see initially was essentially the degradation products in this uh, animal model that I was talking about when we looked, for instance, in the intestinal fluid, but we couldn't really dose ATP until we developed this uh, old uh, technique that I had learned uh, when I was uh, doing the course at Institute Pasteur in the mid-70s, actually, which is to use activated charcoal, because activated charcoal, they pick up ATP and they protect it. So what we did was to do our experiments by adding a <laughs> charcoal in the loops. Uh, it was a bit dirty, and then we, we, we took the content, centrifuge, collected the, the charcoal, eluted, and, and could dose ATP. And basically, we could see that within an hour or two after the tissue had been exposed to uh, this uh, mutant of, of Shigella and not uh, the, the wild-type microorganisms, we had this very strong in vivo release of, of ATP. So that was to us uh, the demonstration that uh, things uh, were in the you know, direction where we thought uh, they were. So this is the kind of experiments that we try to do to, to figure out, uh, you know, how Shigella alters the, the innate immune response. And, uh, you know, basically the, the model here is that as the bacterium engages uh, the cell, ATP is quickly released through these uh, hemichannels, but as the bacterium then injects quickly this IPGD molecule, uh, the production of PI5P is going to close the channel and, and basically the, the, the bacterium has the strategy to, to eliminate this uh, dangerous signaling cascade and, and avoid again uh, the function of ATP uh, which is to, to, to activate the inflammasome, to, to, to maturate T cells, naive T cells into TH17 cells. And the effect is, is really drastic if you do an experiment in which you take a, a, a regularly invasive microorganism, so wild-type microorganisms, and, and aid ATP gamma C, for instance, which is not hydrolyzed, you, you basically destroy the, the whole tissue. So I, I was really surprised by the importance and the, the impact of, of ATP in, in the, this uh, uh, generation of, of inflammation. So I think I could stop essentially here mentioning that there are other regulatory molecules that are highly sophisticated, OSG is a kinase, which basically protects I-cap 
uh, the I kappa B molecule from ubiquity nation. Therefore, the NF kappa B molecule cannot be translocated into the nucleus. OSP F is an interesting molecule that goes to the nucleus, binds to uh, the um, histone protein one. It's kind of a docking process. And from there, it has this phosphatase, and more even a, a phosphorine in lyase, which dephosphorylates and kills P38, ERK1, and ERK2. So it basically blocks the function of uh, the MAP kinase in regulation of, trans of the, the, in the regulation of the transcription of pro-inflammatory genes. It does it by its regular function of activation of the function of PAL2, but also in its capacity to uh, phosphorylate some of the histones. So it, it really established a link between classical gene transcription regulation and epigenetic regulation. And we have a family of IPAH, this molecule which we've shown some years ago to be a family of ubiquitin ligases, for which we are, we are looking for, for targets now. So again, we have sort of unraveled and uh, a series of, of, of regulatory system which uh, at the end of the day uh, do things uh, on the intestinal epithelium which are uh, really a subversive activity. For instance, they have the capacity to basically block the expression of antimicrobial peptides. As you can see here, that's a wild type. Uh, that's an MXIE mutant, which doesn't make a lot of these regulators, of these uh, uh, immune regulatory molecules. So here it is. And, and this is correlated with the survival of bacterium on the surface. And especially with one thing which we mentioned at the beginning, which is essential, which is seems to be for Shigella the accessibility to the crypt. We see that this mutant, which doesn't have these subversive molecules, at least a lot of them, uh, is unable to progress down towards the, the depth of, of, of the crypts, whereas the wild type microorganisms you see has no difficulty apparently to progress. So this is a sort of what I wanted to, 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 to say and, 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 and summarize here. We, we have uh, seen the, the cell biology very quickly, but I think uh, our interest over the years now has focused on this uh, immunoregulatory process. So it's kind of a yin and yang. Microbe needs inflammation to disrupt the barriers, but it quickly needs to uh, downregulate these uh, elements, the antimicrobial peptides, the recruitment of polymorphonuclear cells, the recruitment of dendritic cells we've shown and, and published uh, all this over the last uh, few years. I think Shigella is really a, a nice model to study. And I'm not going to get into anything here just to tell you that uh, Armel Falipo in the lab is also now looking at uh, sort of changing, switching gears a little bit and looking at the direct effect of these uh, regulatory molecules as they are injected into bona fide uh, immune cells, uh, especially in lymphocytes. And uh, we've just recently published that uh, uh, one molecule of the tip of the type 3 secretion system kills B cells. We've shown that uh, uh, IPGD, which is a meta-effector, slows down both in vitro and in vivo the motility of T cells. We've done some uh, uh, nice uh, imaging, for instance, uh, in, uh, in infected lymph nodes where we could uh, essentially correlate the, the motility of, of, of T cells with the presence of uh, microbe at the surface that would inject these effectors into the cells. So, I mean, the, the field is really open to, to ask questions about uh, yes, all this uh, immunoregulatory process. And as I said at the beginning, due to coevolution, these effectors are, are perfect effectors. And I think we I've, I have a hard time to convince companies that they should look more into this. I think they have often a, a sort of classical and conventional visions of uh, innovation with regard to immunoregulation, anti-inflammatory drug. I think that the, the, the molecules, the, the targets are there and, and we should pay a lot more attention to this uh, in the future. Uh, if you have any tricks to convince uh, our colleagues from companies, let me know. I'd be very happy to learn. So these are the, the, the workers who have uh, participated in this work. So these are my uh, institutions. Uh, I'm supported by the HHMI, ERC, and, and uh, the INR, which is the French uh, national agency, for which was because the well, I won't say anything political here because this is not the place. Um, and these are my colleagues in the lab, but I mentioned those who had uh, done the work which I mentioned. 
some uh, collaborators on the campus and my collaborators uh, in different places, uh, including uh, Chris, and, uh, with whom we continue to, to work. Thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> you.